Uh, you're here this afternoon seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in uh, <clears throat> Orleans Parish in October 1998 for second degree murder. You received a life sentence. And then in Jefferson Parish uh, in April of 1997, you received a 40 year sentence for main slaughter. Is that information correct? All right. Your case has been assigned to Mr. Roche. I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Coleman. Good evening. Uh, Madam Chairman, fellow board members, we have before us this afternoon Floyd Duke Coleman, DOC number 380970. Mr. Coleman is here this afternoon seeking a recommendation for a commutation of sentence for a 1998 second degree murder conviction in Arlene's Parish for the premeditated murder of Mr. Floyd Jackson. Mr. Jackson was a childhood friend of Mr. Coleman's. He was found guilty by a jury of his peers as charged on October 13, 1998. And he was sentenced to natural life and hard labor at DOC without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension and sentence. That conviction and sentence was affirmed by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in August of 2000. Mr. Coleman was also arrested on another murder charge in Jefferson Parish that was committed on the same day. Initially, he was charged with first degree murder in Jefferson Parish. But he was allowed to plead guilty to an amended charge of manslaughter with the consent of the victim's family in conjunction with the Jefferson Parish DA's office. Under the plea deal, he was sentenced to 40 years at DOC, the life sentence was to run consecutively with the 40 year sentence for the manslaughter conviction. His total sentence is life plus 40 years. These two arrests are the only arrests on his criminal record. He has no supervision history. Mr. Coleman is currently 49 years old. He was 22 years of age at the time of both offenses. He's been incarcerated for 27 years. Is all that information correct? That's correct. Mr. Coleman, tell this panel this afternoon exactly what happened on June 2nd, 1996 in Orleans Parish. Then you journeyed to St. Ferrero, Louisiana, in Jefferson Parish, and you committed another murder of another childhood friend. We need to know your version of events for the record and tell us exactly what led up to you killing your two friends. Well, as you stated, 
1996, I killed two human beings, Floyd, Floyd, Floyd Jackson and, and, and Mark Carter, following the burglary of my family's home. And I believe that they were responsible for that burglary. One, one second, Mr. Mr. Gold, was it your home or your family's home? It was my family's home. I lived there and I had recently moved out. Okay. Yeah, and one report said it robbed your home. Yeah, yeah I, I had moved out uh, maybe like five or six months prior to the burglary. Okay, so it was your family's home. Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. I had to move out of the home because actually, I, you know, as a result of another one of my bad decisions, I was, I be, became a drug dealer around that time. And I moved out to not bring it so that no harm would come to them as a result of what I was doing. And uh, the, the home was occupied by my adopted father who was, 70 years old and my younger sister who was 16. And uh, they called me one morning and told me that somebody had kicked the door in and ransacked the house. So when I went there, uh, my adopted father said he, he had been at church that morning. And my little sister, she wasn't at home, which I found strange. I asked her, where was she? Somebody had came and picked her up. It was my a girl that I used to date. And me and her had recently had a child together. Mr. Coleman, Mr. Coleman, let's leave out. Let's leave out the unimportant thing. Tell us what you did. Well, on 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 the day of the actual murders itself, because on those days, I could I could easily explain that also. You know, when I uh I was I was upset about the, the process of the burglary and I was still in contact with both of my victims, Florida and Mark, and that the uh the night of that murder, June 2nd, I went to Mark Carter's house first. I knocked on his door and it was my intent to confront him about being involved in a burglary, about a lot of small things that had been going on surrounding that. And I had an illegal weapon with me. It was it was it was my intent to do home. I, I, I didn't go there to uh not trying to I I I'm gonna be honest, death never crossed my mind, but he uh I, I did I, I intended to hurt him. And I went there and I knocked on the door and he we talked about it, we argued. And I, I pulled the gun out on him while we was talking, while we were still arguing. I had it in my hand. I didn't shoot him, but a, a car passed by down the street and he took off running. It was a truck and it was real loud. And he ran all the way to the other side of the street and he, he, he started screaming like he was trying to get the attention of the person who was driving the truck. And that's when I started shooting at him. It was like an empty lot across the street from his house. And he ran into that lot. And that's when I fired the first shots when he got into that lot. And I went into the lot behind him. And he must have been confused and injured and probably just frightened. And he turned around in the lot and he ran back towards me. And I shot him a couple more times. He shot him in the chest and went through his heart and lungs. I believe he was shot in the back. Yeah. One shot in the back and one shot was in the chest. It went through his lungs and his heart. And he was also shot in the head. Okay, so and tell me why you why you had to use your pistol and and, and whip him with your pistol. Why did I have to use it? Why did you pistol whip him after Albert, after he was shot? Well, that wasn't him. That was actually uh, Floyd Jackson that I hit with the gun. Okay, you're talking, 
Okay. So, so I'll I'll, okay, I had to confuse. So it was a, it was Mark that you shot six times, right? Yeah, about five or six times. Okay. And it was Floyd Jackson you shot in the chest and in the in the in the, in the back. And, and 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 Floyd Jackson was shot in the abdomen. In the, yeah, and, and he was the one that I hit with the gun. Okay. So so Floyd Jackson was your first victim. Mark Carter was the first victim. Okay, Mark Carter was the first victim. And that was in Orleans Parish on Berman Highway. Mark Carter was in Jefferson Parish in Marrero. It, it was related to me in the police report, and, I, and it was related to the opposite way. So you first was in, committed the murder in Jefferson Parish. Yes, sir. And that was in Marrero. Yes, sir. And that was Mark Carter. Yes, sir. And he was shot six times. Maybe, so why, maybe. Why, why did you have to shoot him six times? Honestly, I didn't even know if I was hitting him or not because he was running the whole time. Like I said, when he ran into a lot, he never really stopped running uh, until the last shot. So after you finished in Marrero, you proceeded to. Al Jays on Berman Highway. Yes, sir. So after after murdering someone and whipping them with a pistol, you proceeded to take revenge on another human being that you consider to be a childhood friend of yours. Yes, sir. So what did they steal from your home that made you so angry? Well, it was money that was taken, but it was it was more than the burglary itself or the, the money. That's what I was about. Okay, well, was there any drugs in the home? No. Gives the proceeds from the drugs. Yes, sir. So, tell me what your mindset was because you you have been friends with Lord Jackson since you were three years old. You had eaten at his brother's table. She supplied you with clothes at, at different times. You had sleepovers at the house and you made uh, sleeping pallets on the floors. So tell me your mindset that you were so angry <laughs> that you had to commit murders of someone that you found <laughs> all of your life. I just I just felt betrayed and it was a lot of things going on at the time of those uh leading up to the actual homicide because the uh the burglary and the murder were like two months apart. And you know, it was we 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 didn't we didn't mix company no more after that. I mean a little bit, but you know, I just they it was just so many things that was going on when he was speaking about it. And, 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 and I felt like I was being betrayed a second time because I used to talk to Mark still all the way up until the time of the, of the murder, but he would talk to me and, and he was like, he was trying to, I'm not saying anything about the murder. I'm not accusing it at the burglary. I'm not accusing anybody. I'm not pointing the finger. I'm not acting like I'm upset with him. But he's hanging with me and he's asking me, he's trying to find out like who did it and he's helping me, you know, discover things. But at the same time, he's telling me 
he's throwing Floyd's name in, like, to see how I respond to it. But the whole time, he's telling people uh, that he thinks, I think this person did it and this person was involved, and it was just causing more confusion and frustration. So, yes. So you are telling me this afternoon there was two months in between the burglary of your family home and the murders. Yes. There was that cooling down period. Yes. Two months. This was not a heat of the moment decision. This was a premeditated decision to take revenge on someone who broke into your home and stole your money. Yes. Thank you, sir. Finally, in October of 2022, in a statement that you gave to a parole officer, you finally admitted that you brought your own gun and used it in the sheet. Before that, you said that the first victim pulled a gun on you. In fact, you said both victims pulled a gun on you. And First victim dropped his gun, you used it to kill that person, then you brought his gun and yeah. killed Floyd Jackson. Right, and none of that was true. That was a statement that I made to the police that the police coerced me to, into making to, to get me to talk and to make it seem like I was making a, 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 a case with mitigation for myself and it wasn't, it wasn't true. It wasn't my words. So when did the light go off and when did you decide that the best thing is to tell the truth? From, from them having a gun? Yeah. Well, that was the only time that I said that. I didn't, uh, it wasn't a trial tactic or anything like that. It was just something that they got to me to say just so that I can say something against myself. The police. The police urge you to say that? Yes, sir. I don't really, I don't really understand that, but I thought that was your testimony after you were arrested that you acted in self-defense. That was my statement to the police. Okay. And that was a statement of your own volition. No, it wasn't. You were urged to say that? Yes, sir. If I had a choice, I wouldn't have made a statement at all. But that was their way. I, when they first arrested me, I wouldn't say anything for a, a couple of hours. But they was telling me that, you know, they knew I did it, they had this and this, and they could prove it anyway, and I could show mitigation for myself, and I might get a lighter sentence if I said that they had a weapon. And that was one of the things that they told me to say, but common sense would tell me myself that it's, it's not possible because the gun was a revolver. After I, I fired five or six shots at Mark Carter and used the same gun on Floyd, so I had the bullets, you know, but I said it because they told me to say that. Okay. Thank you, sir. And our position in this case comes from the Jefferson Parish DA's office, the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's office, and the New Orleans Police Department. The Floyd Jackson family is adamantly opposed to any clemency Mr. Coleman, we have seven impact statements and four or five letters of strong opposition from the Jackson family. In support of clemency, we have Ms. Kendra Edwards, a friend, Mr. Reynard L. Thomas, 
a reentry coordinator for Section A of Criminal Court in New Orleans. Uh, we have Ms. Belmont Sellers, a peer supporter, Mr. Troy Rhodes. He is a um, reentry specialist with the Total Community Action Reentry Program of the Warriors. Uh, Stephanie Mills, Catholic Charities Reentry Program. And you have a very fine letter from a maintenance supervisor at Louisiana State Penitentiary. Your brother, Herbert Hill uh, has submitted a letter and you will be living with your brother, is that correct? Yes, sir. In New Orleans? Yes, sir. And you'll be working for a Mac Faith loan service in New Orleans, is that correct? Yes, sir. Mr. Coleman has a low risk assessment. He has a low needs assessment. He's housed in minimum security. He has a good institutional record. His current job is legal worker three. He's a consul substitute. How long have you been a consul substitute, Mr. Coleman? Uh, about 20 or 21 years. I, I see why you took a couple of years off, like 2012 to 2015, but you've been doing that since about 2009? 2002, actually. 2002, okay. Uh, Mr. Cohen has eight disciplinary write-ups in 27 years, the last one being in March of 2012, an aggravated disobedience some 11 and a half years ago. Is that still true today, Mr. Coleman? That is true, yes, sir. Programs completed, 100 hours pre-release, anger management, living in balance parts one and two. He's had constant substitute training. He's currently enrolled in victim awareness training. Tell us about uh, victim awareness and how it's going. Well, well, victim awareness is is a uh, it's an excellent class for me because I I, I learned a few things uh, regarding my situation the way it happened anyway because uh, it was a thing called uh, victim precipitation that I discovered that you can have a situation that snowballs from between a person and the victim, small things that build up into a particular thing. It can build up to a violent crime between yourself and a person. And uh, that's something I, that I really wish I would have been more conscious of. And, and, and the fact, along with the fact that, you know, that you can talk to, you can talk to people when you see this thing happening like that including your own family and, and, and also the impact of the crime that has on a uh, victim's family and, and of course my own family in, a, in the long run. You, know, you think it's just losing a person, but it, it affects everybody in many different ways. Thinking, you know, thinking back, Mr. Coleman, <laughs> thinking back, do you think that's what happened to you? There was a lot of small things adding up. Yes, sir, absolutely. And you didn't address them? Yes, that, so that was the problem. When, <clears throat> when your family's home was burglarized? Yes, sir. It added to the fuel to the fire? It was a major part of it. So, when will you complete anger management? <laughs> I completed anger management. Oh, it's victim awareness that I'm enrolled in. Okay. I'm sorry. When will you finish <laughs> victim awareness? Well, I'll, I'll complete it in about another uh, 
two another month or two. Yeah, but also, uh, are there any other programs like Thank You for a Change, Malachi Dads, or any other program that you've completed? I haven't taken either one of those, no. So the other programs you've completed was a $100 free release, anger management, living in balance, and you're currently enrolled in victim away. Yes, sir. So that's four good time programs. Why haven't you taken more good time programs during your incarceration? Well, previously I was housed at Camp C. And for one, Camp C does not have a didn't have a lot of the programming that we experience in the main prison. And another thing is that I my job as an offender counsel substitute, it it really tied me up and it it was a heavy mental burden for a long time because when we do the cell blocks, uh, we help guys in the cell blocks, it's a constant thing. It's all day. We, it's like we have to deal with them plus, plus the people that we live around. So every day our time is divided, you know, between helping those guys and doing their legal work. And then we have to take care of our own affairs with the legal work side, which is one of the reasons I ended up taking a break in 2009 because I, I just didn't have my own things under control for a while. But but in the future, I'd like to, for you to continue being a constant substitute, but concentrate more on your rehabilitation. Yes, sir. Because that's, <laughs> that's the main reason you're incarcerated. Yes, sir be rehabilitated and uh, you need all the ammunition you can <laughs> muster if and when you ever release. Uh, let's talk about alcohol and drugs. At what age did you start using drugs? I think the first time I smoked marijuana, I was 15. 15. And did, did you graduate anything stronger? Uh, I tried cocaine at, at 19. And when did you start selling drugs? I think I started selling drugs at 17. So how long had you sold drugs prior to the uh, burglary of your home, your family's home? About five years. So you're telling me that you had moved out six months because you were worried or concerned about the safety of your family but you had been selling drugs for five years prior to that. Yes, sir. So why did you move out when you did? Well, for one reason, because I became able. I was able, but I had the money to do it. And mm -hmm. the, my drug dealing trade had gotten a lot larger at that time. And it was just. So why didn't you tell me the truth in the first place? About what? When I asked you, did you live in the home? She said, no, I had moved out six months before because I feared for the life of my family who lived in a home. Yes, why, sir, that's what I'm saying. Why didn't you tell me that you had come to the point where you had <laughs> enough money to splurge and find your own place? Well, because it was also a factor that I was being becoming more known and noticeable to people and in that time. And my adopted father made that suggestion to me that, you know, maybe I should so get my own. So you extra to me. Huh? So your adopted father asked you to leave because of your drug trade. Well, he didn't ask me to, but he said I should think about it, consider it. He didn't, he really didn't want me to leave. He he hated to see me leave. Okay. Um, 
Mr. Coleman, have you ever used, abused alcohol? No, I've used it, but on not not very often. So tell me what you have done to treat your addiction to drugs in the last 27 years. Well, I, I attend uh, AA meetings every now and then. There's a there's a class on Saturday night, uh, a sober group, AA Living in Balance. I still I still I'm still a part of that. But you attend sporadic. Yes, it's like uh, a Saturday night class, and I have a a Bible study that sometimes it's on Saturday night also, and I would go to that first. Sure. What programs have you taken except living in balance to deal with your drug addiction? None. Are you a drug addict? Uh, I would I would say I would say that I, I would say yes because it's a simple question. Are you a drug addict? Yes. Yes. Why haven't you dealt with that and got treatment? Well, besides the living in balance class and the sober group, I haven't I haven't seen anything else at the time. Think it's about time. Yes, sir. It's always time. I can. I. I, I want to always try that because drug addiction is a disease. You let that disease the rest of your life, and you have to deal with it, treat it, and and, and make sure that you're equipped if situation ever arises again that you might want to go back to it. <clears throat> and if you don't deal with it and get treatment, how can you deal? I agree. So basically, you have no ongoing sobriety plan on how you're going to deal with it <clears throat> if and when you release. You have no plan at all, simply because you hadn't you hadn't sought the proper treatment to deal with your addiction. Until you do, you, you can't come up with a sobriety plan that will help you to stay away from drugs and alcohol. Do you agree with me? Yes. Warren Falgo, do you have any comments, remarks, observations at this time? Yeah. Mr. Roche, you pretty much spelled it out with the, the fact that you know he's been incorporated here um, 26 years, um, eight write-ups has maintained work uh, as legal aid for the last 20. Uh, he did take a break and uh, do work for us from 2009 up until uh, 2013, uh, doing maintenance work for us uh, in, in various areas. As far as his, his body of work here during his incarceration, uh, in that respect, He's done well for us. Thank you, Warren. Madam Chairman, <clears throat> because of the nature of these offenses and the lack of treatment for his drug addiction, this is a very difficult case for me. I have not come up with a recommendation as yet, but I will listen intently to the rest of your testimony. And I will come up and be ready 
to make a decision at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Um, we'd like to hear from uh, the folks who want to speak in support. And they're all there with, uh, with Mr. Coleman. First, we'd like to hear from Herbert Hill. Go ahead, sir. Oh, you can uh, keep your... I watched my brother grow up in this place. When I think of Angola, I think of a place of danger and violence. I have always been afraid for him, not just phys physical well-being, but his mental health. <laughs> but his mental health, he has shown us uh, he has shown us maturity because not only does he continue to drive, to thrive, but he constantly progress in good ways and he keeps a positive attitude. And he is not the same person he was when he committed these crimes. His mind has been in a better place even when he believed he didn't have any hope of getting out. So I know he's he's really he's ready to be a part of society again. And we hope he gets another chance. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dwayne Hilton. Yes, Dwayne Hamilton. Hamilton. Okay, I'm sorry. My condolences. Oh. Go ahead, sir. My condolences to the family. Um, I've been hearing about this uh, drug uh, rehabilitation process. I am a formal ex drug addict. I work for a Nonprofit organization in New Orleans, which is called Bethel Community Transformation. And if possible, on him being released, that is one of the programs that he can attend where he'll be surrounded by other men that will get the proper treatment and help through Jesus Christ based upon uh the healing and the transformation along with the new orleans baptist theological center which is right across the street from our program um i know he feels remorse about his previous uh situation but at the same time with the help of god and jesus and other men that struggled through addiction along with classes can overcome that terrible disease that affect the human beings of the world today. Again, I am a, a staff member and one of the facility management. Um, if there was any kind of way that we can get him in that program, it would be no problem along with being here was an eye opener based upon the time and the ability to seek um, forgiveness. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. And uh, we have Janice Barnett. I am his younger sister. Um, I, did, I think he has changed. He is really a different person from when he came in. And I think that I need him. His dad needs him. And I need him with my daughter as well, because I have him at home with me. And I feel like he will be a big help to me. 
Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We appreciate you all traveling to be with him today and sharing your comments with us. Uh, we'd like to hear from the from the opposition, uh, and we do have uh, three members from uh, each family who will be speaking. So I'm going to be. I ask you to be mindful of your allotted time. First, we'll ask for Ms. Jasmine Granfrey. You tell us um, what you'd like us to know. First, state your relationship to the victim. Hello, my name is Jasmine, and I'm the niece of Floyd King Jackson. Um, is it okay that I show um, the board a picture that I have with my uncle? Sure. This is me as a baby with my uncle. And it is the only picture that I have with my uncle because I was six months old when his life was taken from him. And so I don't have the memories that my mother and the rest of my family have of my uncle. I was the last baby of our family that he would ever get to meet. And now I'm 27 years old, so I'm already older than my uncle. My uncle never got the chance to even see the age of 22. Although I have no memories of him for myself, I have certainly felt his absence and the sadness that has brought my family and myself. My mother has told me about how excited he was about my birth and those six months, those first six months of my life would sadly be the last six of his. Growing up, I never knew why I felt such a closeness to him. And I would ask my mother to tell me stories, all the funny stories about him over and over. My older cousins also have great memories of him. And so I know he would have been a great uncle to me and to all my cousins that came after me. And of course, he will never get the chance to have children of his own. I wish he could have been here for our high school graduations, our birthday parties, our college graduations, our weddings. But most of all, I wish he had been allowed to live. I wish that his life had not been taken from him by someone that he had once called his friend. I wish the man that killed him, who is now asking for a second chance to continue his life, would have given a chance to my uncle to live out his life and his hopes and dreams as God intended for him to do. I wish he had a chance to still be with here with us. My whole family loved him. And even though I don't have any memories of him, I love him. <laughs> And just as my uncle helped to look after me as a baby, I'm here today to help him. And my family and the Carter family keep a murderer of two young people behind bars. His nonchalant attitude in describing these murders has shown that there is no remorse. And so I asked the board to please deny his request. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we have Kenneth Jackson. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for allowing me to have a moment to share my thoughts about this. Uh, uh, what I would like to say is, uh, growing up as a kid, I watched what I thought was a beautiful friendship between my brother Floyd Jackson and Floyd Coleman. Uh, walking them to the park, uh, playing sports at the park, and as you mentioned, uh, the love that my family showed, showed him. He was literally one of uh, my younger brothers, sharing food, clothes, and, and I, I want to point out the fact that uh, this young man, this well, not not young anymore, Floyd Coleman, he was picked on a lot growing up. And my brother always defended him. I always defended him. And, you know, just to, he, he mentioned the precipitation of events that snowball into something bigger. 
but he didn't go truly into detail to what that is. So I would like to share that. He's told me, Floyd Coleman, on his, on, from his own mouth when we were young men, he said, man, Floyd's so lucky, man. Yeah, you know, he got a family that, that gave him a car and make sure he okay and you always checking on him. You know, I didn't have that. So that, that snowball was derived from, I believe, a sense of jealousy. The Carter family, you know, um, Mark Carter and my brother, they were tall, handsome, charismatic men. And, and they were strong. They came from Christian families. And he didn't have that. And, and I get that. that. That's a sad thing that he didn't have that because I understand the history of his family. You know, but at the same time, that is not a reason to. Due to your protector, your best friend, to show up and shoot him two times. And as he's laying on the ground, stand over him and strike him four times on the, on the left side of his head, leaving lacerations. That's not enough. You're going to turn around to the right side of his head and strike him seven times, leaving lacerations. My brother didn't die from his gunshot wounds. He died from being beat to death. So, what, ladies and gentlemen of this panel and his family and, and Herbert, his brother, I've always had great admiration for Herbert. I ain't seen him in, haven't seen him in years, but he's always been an upstanding man. That's who, if he gets out, he should be going to stay with because his brother Herbert was threatening my family after he was arrested. But that's who he's gonna go stay with. So it shows how sorry he is. But I want the panel to know what you have sitting in front of you right there is the modern day version of Judas. He murdered somebody who loved him and protected him. No, he should not be let out of jail. After his body expires, he should still be on that property. Thank you. And we have Lucretia Jackson. You're on mute. Can you unmute your mic? Hi, I'm Latricia Jackson. I'm uh, Floyd King Jackson's oldest sister. He was my baby brother. Uh, yesterday, I was overcome with a flood of anxiety and emotions um, having to relive this. And I cried all day, but I made sure to come in my room when I would cry because I didn't want to upset my mother, who's now 81 years old. That summer in 1996, was the most devastating thing that ever happened to my entire family. My mother had just lost her father. She had lost her brother to cancer. And then she lost her youngest son, her youngest child to murder, all within about three months. I never believed that it was fully about this so-called robbery, but what he failed to tell you was, that when the police came out to investigate, they didn't find where no door had been kicked in. That was a lie. Just like he sat there and he lied and he said that Floyd, I mean, not Floyd, that Mark was basically throwing Floyd's name out there. I don't believe that for a second. Mark didn't tell him that my brother did that burglary. He made up in his mind that they both did it because he was jealous of them. My brother had pulled away from him. And he and Mark had actually gotten even closer. And that's what he was jealous of. You know, he, my brother saw what road he was headed down. And he pulled away from him. And for him to use this so-called burglary as an excuse to murder him was about as a colder thing that you could ever do to another human being, let alone two people. My daughter who spoke was only about six months old. After he passed, she couldn't walk. So she would pull up on the sofa or the coffee table and hold on to it and walk around to the end table till she would get to his picture sitting on the end table and she'd stand and just stare at his picture. She'd lean on the table and just 
there at his picture. And at that point in time, I was not just grieving for the loss of my brother. I wasn't just grieving for myself. I started to have to grieve for my daughter because I knew she didn't understand. She was wondering where he was, why he wasn't coming to see her anymore. My brother was young, handsome, charismatic. He was funny. Everybody wanted to be around him. And he loved Floyd Coleman. And for him to do that to him was wrong on so many levels. My mother fed them. He slept at our house and he betrayed her. He repaid her by murdering her son. And to this day, I've never gotten over that. My parents have never gotten over the loss of their son. And for him to sit there and make up these stories and pretending to be a drug addict, he didn't take part in any programs because he was never a drug addict. He's using that as another excuse for what he did. You don't kill two people in, in the same night. He thought he was smart. He killed Mark in Jefferson Parish and he paid and convinced somebody to lure my brother to Orleans. I don't think my brother ever even knew Mark was dead because hours later, he went down there and he still killed my brother. He showed no remorse yes, at yeah. all. He showed no mercy. And I am against him getting any early release. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Um, now we'll hear from the Carter family. We have Robin Carter. You're on mute. Can you find me? Can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Well, thank you to the board for allowing me to, to speak today. <clears throat> I am Robin Carter. I'm Mark Carter's oldest sister, the oldest of our family. And I don't even know where to begin. I'm, I'm grateful that I had an opportunity to hear just a little bit of what happened that night. I'm a good bit older than Mark, so I didn't know all, all of Mark's friends. I actually didn't know um, Floyd Coleman. I, I, I had no idea who he was. But I can tell you this. I'm going to first start off from saying I listened to Mr. Coleman's statement. And I have to say that I don't believe that there is any remorse. I believe that Mr. Coleman has said what he knows um, and has rehearsed to be said for an early release. Mr. Coleman, if he had any remorse, there is no way that he could not have apologized to the family members that he has devastated. My brother and Mr. Jackson, my prayers that they are with the Lord. So they're not in hurt, they're not hurting or in harm at this point. And I have tried to find over the last 26, 27 years, a way to forget how he devastated my family. I can forgive him because this is what the God that I serve teaches me to forgive. Our lives can't move on without forgiveness, but I will never forget what Mr. Coleman has done. He has taken away my baby brother. He's taken away a father. He, his son was about two years old, maybe. He's taken away a brother to other siblings, a son to my father, who was, my mother was deceased at the time, from a grandson. We cannot bring Mark back and, and Mr. Jackson back. But his fate is in the hands of God at this point. I understand. But I will not do anything to help that process. 
It has to be the process of the Lord and the professionals there to make that decision. In my estimation, Mr. Floyd Coleman would do a better job inside of the walls where if all these things that he's participating in and being a part of, he can use that to help other men on the inside. There is too much hurt and pain that is still on the outside. Too soon, too hurtful. I, I believe that this incident is so traumatic that it even helped usher my life into cancer. Thank God I'm healed. But you have brought so much devastation from a horrible decision that you made that night, yet still very premeditated because you had ample time from the time that you murdered my brother and the time that you brought yourself to the location to murder Mr. Jackson and devastate their family. You had time to think about that. Carter, address your remarks to the board and, and wrap it up for us, please. My wrap up is that you should never be out on the street again, ever. <clears throat> that you bring yourself to the point that you can find a way to ask forgiveness from these families for how you have devastated them. And that is why I feel that Floyd Coleman should not have an early release, that he should never be released. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We appreciate your remarks. Mr. Oscar Carter. Yes, I'm here. Go ahead, sir. All right. Floyd Jackson and Mark Carter and Coleman were friends. I could not believe till this day what happened. Uh, Floyd Coleman, you devastated my life. My brother Mark was my best friend and my brother. We slept in the same room for his whole 18 years until I, I moved out on my own. He was my best friend. Right now, I still dream about Mark, my brother. But the sad thing is, I can only picture him at 21 years old. I, I can't see him as a as a, a man right now 49 years old uh with his son with his granddaughter uh and and and, and I can't believe that you expect us to have mercy on you when and and, and you really want to come home and 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 live your life uh like nothing ever happened and we have to keep suffering through this every day i will never be the same person i was before my brother passed every year for his birthday for 27 years i have gone to put flowers on his grave I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that for the rest of my life. You, you, ruin, you ruin my life. You ruin my sister's life, my dad. You're a liar. Mr. Carter, you, a murderer. Can you direct your comments to the board and not to Mr. Yes. Coleman. Well, Mr. Mr. Coleman is a liar. He's a murderer. He's an animal, and I really don't think there's any way that the board should allow him to come in and mix in society right now 
where there are other crimes that's happening in our in the New Orleans metropolitan area area every day. I don't think he's a changed man. And an early release for him will be devastating to our family. Like my sister said, I think if, if he's so involved in helping people, let him stay behind those walls and help whoever he needs to help. Yes, sir. Thank you. There are, con there are consequences for your actions. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. We appreciate your remarks. And we also have Ms. Tracy Jones. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Tracy Carter Jones, and I'm here with my sister Karen. And as both families, my, my siblings, Oscar and Robin, and the Jackson family, there's nothing that I could say different because I feel the same identical way. There's only one difference that I feel, and I'm begging you to please not allow Mr. Coleman to be released. Mr. Coleman is safer in that prison than Mr. Coleman would be on the streets. The entire community who cared so much for my brother Mark and Floyd Jackson, our families and our, our friends and all of Floyd's and Mark's family and friends, it would not be good for Mr. Uh, Coltman to be released. And, and that's all that I have to say. He is safer behind those bars. He shows no remorse, just like they said. He didn't think enough of us to say before he even opened his mouth, I'm sorry. And he made these lies up for years. I knew my brother had never pulled a gun out on him. And just like the other family said, He's always been jealous. That part. Always. We came from good. Mark came from good. And, the, so, did and so did Floyd Jackson. And I'm begging you not to put the community at risk or even Mr. Coleman at risk by allowing him to come out. Nobody needs to go through being incarcerated or I don't need to be worried about whether one of my friends or family would get themselves in trouble. I don't ever want to see his face again. Thank you. I'm in opposition. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. And uh, do we have the DA's office still with us? Yes, ma'am. You hear me, Ms. Renata? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Randy Meyer, assistant DA in Jefferson Parish. And we are opposed to Mr. Coleman's uh, request for a commutation of his sentence. Um, the version of offense of the events as, as stated by Mr. Coleman really are concerning. Um, you know, six months after the burglary, he shot and killed two of his friends multiple times. These were retaliatory murders. Uh, and he wasn't even certain, it sounded like from his statements, he wasn't even certain that Mr. Carter was a person who burglarized his house. So it, it, it's very concerning to me. I think there's some psychological work that he has to deal with um, before he could even be considered as a candidate for early release. Uh, and if we look at what he has done since he's been incarcerated, his rehabilitative programs are very limited. You no, know, he's been involved as a substitute inmate counsel, but that's not really helping him with the the needs he he really needs, the issues that he needs to deal with in order to be rehabilitated. You know, he's only had as as has come out, you know, living in balance, anger management, and a hundred hours. Um, he's currently enrolled in um, victim awareness. He's had nothing to deal with the addiction problem that he's suffering with. 
And finally, there's very strong, as you've heard, very, very strong victim opposition. Uh, so for those reasons, we'd request the board to deny his request for a commutation. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Mr. Meyer. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Coleman, uh, is there a statement you'd like to make to the board before we vote and address your remarks to the board? Um, uh, just that I, I'm thankful for the opportunity that I had today to at least be heard. And I, I do regret uh, not uh, making my regrets and, and my mistakes. My bad judgment made known to the victim's family that I would have apologized about what happened. It was a terrible time, and it's, it's murder is it's just it's something you don't get over. And I wish that I, it, there was something that I could do, or if I would have changed my mind back then, or just been a di different person, had a different mindset. And, and and not been the type of person who would have committed such a crime because it's, it's something that I would definitely always regret. All right, thank you. I think we are prepared to vote, Mr. Roche. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Coleman. Yes, sir. Based upon adamate opposition from the Jackson and Carter's family, strong opposition from the DA's office, opposition from law enforcement in, in the Jefferson Parish area, and most of all, a lack of rehabilitative programs, especially in the area of substance abuse, I deny your request. Mr. Mayor Bauer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, my vote would be the same for the same reasons. Mr. Freeman. I do heard. Mrs. Jackson. My vote is the same for the same reasons. Mr. Uh, Coleman, you know, you've done some good work as an Yeah, um, I, I felt like this was an interview that just became more and more kind of upsetting as, as, as it went on. It's like you find out that he, that he took two lives of his like close friends over, over like possibly nothing. And it is shocking as it goes through and you listen to the, well, we had Randy Meyer, the assistant district attorney show up and, you know, he wasn't on, 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 on camera. So it kind of surprised me when all of a sudden he spoke and he shows up to almost all of his hearings. But he was wrong about one of the facts. He said that it was six months later, but no, it was two months later when these, when he took his, his vengeance out on on his friends and it's just it is terrifying to think about that it's not you know at the beginning when he started telling mr o'shea what what he did it, it it almost made it seem like the way i was hearing it was someone broke into the home and he in a rage went and and killed them which was which is bad enough as it is but that's something that you can almost see happening in a sense. This was totally different. This was two months later. Two months later, he, he does this and it's just, it, it, it's scary. And he doesn't seem to show remorse. It, it, there's almost like there's no tears there's no uh we have seen so many different types of final statements that kind of seem to to express emotion but you just didn't you didn't get it there i didn't feel the remorse like like randy said maybe he needs you know psychiatric help I,
we can go over the some of the information that we have and thank you richard for providing it there, there there's not as much as 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 you might have hoped for but there's some information in in, in his appeal So on July 31st, 1997, he was indicted for second degree of Floyd Jackson at his arraignment on September 18th. He pled not guilty. That's just for one of them, right? After conducting several hearings, the trial court denied his motion to suppress evidence on May 22nd, 1998, and his motion to suppress the statement on May 28th. The appellant sought writs for the ruling on the denial of the suppression in the statement and an unpublished decision. This court denied writs, finding that the trial court did not abuse its discretion by so ruling. So. Hey, I got to finish. So here are the facts of the case. Basically, they, they denied his, his, his appeal. Um, in the early morning hours of June 2nd, 1996, police officers were called to 3306 um, to investigate the, the Red Room. Floyd Jackson. Jackson had been shot twice. Daddy, can you please me cards? I can play with you cards? Yes. In yeah. five minutes. I'll, I'll finish up soon. Okay, so hospital where he later passed away. The autopsy showed that he died from two gunshot wounds. The first bullet entered his left chest and went through his heart and, and right lung, exited his chest and entered his right arm where it lodged. The other bullet entered and exited his right forearm, entered the exited his right thigh, and then entered and exited his abdominum. Although the bullet from the latter wound was lost, the bullet from the former wound was recovered in his arm. In addition to the gunshot wounds, and this is what uh, this is what Kenneth was talking about. He spoke quite well, I thought. Um, he said that there were lacerations. So he said, remember, he said that he was hit in the head. Um, so in addition to the gunshot wounds, there were deep lacerations on each side of his head. Four on the left side. Uh, near the ear and seven on the right side. So like what he really did, he sat over him and beat him. Uh, now, unlike what Kenneth said, where that was what is what killed him, they, they that differs here in this report. It says that these lacerations caused no damage to his brain or skull. And, and the bullet that went through his heart was what did it, right? The coroner testified that these lacerations were consistent with having been made during a pistol whipping with... Um, a gun handle. Plastic pieces of the handle were found at the scene, and Jackson's had a level of 0 0.03 alcohol. There are no traces of, of the devil's lettuce in his urine. He also had a half inch cut on the bottom of the left foot. On the same date, the Jefferson Parish deputies were investigating um, the, the red room of, of Mark Carter a friend of Jackson, and I don't say red rum and jest, I do it because of YouTube. Cart sustained multiple gunshot wounds and four bullet wounds. I'm sorry, I, just, I had to get up for a second. Um, I'm coming back. Jefferson deputies were investigating a of, of friend of Jackson. Carter sustained multiple wounds and four bullets were recovered during the autopsy. These bullets were compared with the bullets retrieved during Jackson's autopsy, and it was determined that they were fired from the same gun, a 38 caliber. Although no weapon was recovered, one firearm identification expert said, yeah, it was the same, the same weapon. Uh, they um, quickly identified him as a suspect. They obtained an, an arrest warrant 
And on June 9th, um, after he left his girlfriend's home, the deputies advised him of his rights and transported him to the police station. Once there, the deputies again advised him of his rights, which he waived, and he gave his first statement wherein he denied any involvement in it whatsoever, indicating that he was with his girlfriend at the time of, of the offenses. However, <laughs> his girlfriend did not give him an alibi. So after learning his girlfriend uh, gave a statement wherein she refused to cooperate his alibi, Goldman gave a second statement where he confessed to shooting both Carter and Jackson. And this was part of his appeal. He wanted the, this confession to be redacted. Uh, in Coleman's second statement, which was played at trial, so they played it, the recording, he stated that uh, that at his resi that his residence had been burglarized some time prior to the shooting and that he learned that Carter and Jackson had committed a burglary. Coleman stated that he also heard that Carter knew he suspected Carter and that Carter intended to kill him. Coleman stated that when Carter's resident, he went to Carter's residence to talk to Carter about the burglary and Carter met him outside. Carter went back inside his residence briefly and then came back outside. As they spoke about the burglary, Carter became angry and pulled a gun. Remember, this is his now confession. And this is what he was talking about at the beginning when he told Mr. O'Shea that the police had told him to say this. Which I actually believe, uh, I'm sure if, if like you, like me, you've probably seen many, many, many uh, interrogations and the police do start by suggesting, well, we understand you're a good guy. You must have been afraid for your life. Did he pull a weapon? You know, and they won't tell you, like he said, oh, they told me to say it, but they'll coax you into saying it. And I believe that's that's probably what he was talking about. Mr. O'Shea, they coaxed him into this statement, but they didn't tell him to say it. He, uh, They're just like, oh, he's like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I was in fear for my life. They pulled a weapon. So he went with that. By that time, he said Coleman had pulled a weapon. Coleman started, uh, stated Carter, then dropped his gun and started running. So this is remember this is just a story. Coleman admitted that he then picked up Carter's gun, a 38 caliber, and ran after Carter. Goldman told deputies that he shot Carter, emptying the six shotgun because he figured Carter would eventually kill him if he did not do so. Coleman then left in his car. He stated um, that he knew where to find Jackson and waited at that location until Jackson returned. Coleman stated that he and Jackson argued about the burglary and that he used Carter's gun to shoot Jackson, who he insisted it was also threatening him. Coleman stated he had reloaded Carter's gun with the ammunition he happened to possess. He admitted he also fired six shots at Jackson, and then he took the gun out of Jackson's pocket. Coleman stated that he threw the murder, so both of them had guns. He took both their guns. He, you know, he's, he's just, he was so in fear for his life. They searched the canal where he said he threw it, but they never found it. Mildred Jackson, Floyd Jackson's mother, which is so sad to think, she testified at length about the former friendship between her son and Coleman. She testified at length without objection concerning what she had heard about her son Carter's murder. All right, I said it. She testified that when she saw her son at the hospital before he died, he identified Coleman as a man who shot him. So he's in the hospital passing away. And the mother hears him say it was him. Then they go on to try to say, oh, he wasn't read his rights. He, 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 or he was read his rights, but first he said he wasn't talking or whatever. It was a bogus appeal and rightfully denied. Th this, to think about he's the house is robbed they don't even get into how much money he says was stolen but he felt he was he was disrespected he didn't like randy Myers said he didn't seem to know for sure it was them he just thought it was them and he then he doesn't just he 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 they're not it's not like they're both together and maybe they got in a fight and he lost his temper he planned it unarmed friends because he thinks that maybe they robbed him and it's two months later and he's still harboring this 
feeling where he's willing to risk it all to destroy their lives because of what? There is something uh, scary about that. And, you know, it's not a crime. If, uh, it, 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 it's like to wait two months. And I, I'm bringing that up like, well, this shouldn't even make a difference. It could have happened on the spot at that moment. But it's like if you just want to r- rationalize and think about, you know, they're, they're, they were still friends. They were still hanging out after after that and and then he and 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 then he brutally does it too and one bullets to the head like a sat like a a a assassination style and and he pistol was and it's just the 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 terror of it and then he i didn't see any type of remorse or expression of remorse or anything that made you feel like he did have empathy or felt poorly about it. Um, And all the pain of their family is so fresh and raw. And it's, it was hard to imagine. It was hard to imagine that they would ever have commuted a sentence. And, you know, you put this in comparison to the to the one we just saw, where you served 40 years. Um, it, still, it still does seem different, but... Wow. Um, anyways, love to hear your thought on it. And with that, I'll let you go.